Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate and this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. Have you been enjoying your summer reading? Do you know what to read next? Are you after easy reads that you'll fly through? Or is summer for you an opportunity to tackle something more substantial? Or maybe you want a book you can pass around poolside and discuss. One woman with her finger firmly on the summer reading pulse is Chrissy Ryan, owner of Book Bar, the convivial North London bookshop where you're as likely to find a new great read as to make some new bookish friends. So, with a rare bit of British sun on my shoulders, I headed over there to find out the books they're recommending for summer reading, plus a few to look forward to in the autumn. We began, though, by reflecting on the runaway success of Book Bar, two years after opening. It's been the ride of my life. (laughs) It's been absolutely extraordinary. The amount of support and good vibes we've had from people has been amazing and people have really got behind us and they've got it you know like you do something like this it's a huge risk it's immensely scary but you have to back yourself it has to go well to a certain extent otherwise it's not going to survive and you have to back yourself that it's going to go as well as you hope because that's why you do it and it's been amazing and I'm so proud and pleased We've got a wonderful, wonderful team and amazing customers. (laughs) I don't really know what else to say. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think it's testament to its success, the way that it feels like you just can't imagine it ever not having been here in the physical space here in Highbury and Islington, but also then I suppose your online presence and just a voice in the bookish community out there. Our whole ethos is about celebrating the social side of reading and bringing people together through books. And it's been amazing to see that develop with Book Bar. And people might not realise you haven't been here in person, but it's actually, it's not that big a space. But of no. course, the brilliant thing about that is it's a really conversational space. You know, you're quite close to other people. So it's very easy just to casually, oh, you know, what are you reading or whatever. It's very conducive to conversation. All right, let us turn to summer reading. Now, on the table in front of us, we've got two, I think, big hitters that I feel we must mention, both of which I've read. The first is The Guest by Emma Klein, which you recommended to me. Woo! And also I noticed it appeared on many a summer reading list when the newspapers do all their summer reading picks. This was the book that I felt kept being mentioned again and again. So I was like, okay, fine. (laughs) It's definitely one that I must read. It's set on Long Island. The main character is a young woman who is basically making her way through the world, being supported by various men that she has relationships with. But her situation is quite precarious because she's also on the run from a relationship back in New York that went very badly wrong. And she ended up leaving that relationship and taking something that she shouldn't have. And so now she's on the run in hiding and she's met this man, Simon, He's invited her to spend a month with him in his amazing, beautiful, luxurious house on Long Island, his beach house. And that's where we meet her. And so she's in this world of luxury and privilege and wealth, but she's not part of it. Yeah, it's really brilliant on class and privilege. And she is this amazing chameleon-like person in that she finds herself over the course of a week essentially navigating Long Island and metamorphosing into a different character according to what's going to help her get by that day. Mm. So she poses as someone's nanny at this very fancy beach club and she poses as the friend of some people she's met at a party and it's all really about her surviving. We were really lucky to have Emma Klein do an event with us. She was interviewed by Julia Armfield. She was saying that actually... This character, if she wasn't white, if she wasn't beautiful, if she was slightly different, would she be able to chameleon her way through these situations? And that was a really interesting point that I felt added another layer to the book. It's really good and very tense. If you're looking for a really plotty read, it's not that. It's just got this undercurrent that propels you through. Absolutely. It's building towards something and you have to know how things turn out. So I think, I mean, actually, 
I don't generally enjoy this kind of book. I don't really want to feel tense on holiday, mm. but I think a lot of people do. And so this, I think, is a strong recommend. And the other one I wanted to flag up is Yellow Face by Rebecca F. Quang. Interesting that her previous novel, Babel, which is set in, I'd say, a lightly fantasy world. Mm -hmm. She's R.F. Quang. Yes. And then for this, her literary fiction, she's now Rebecca. <laughs> this is a very striking book from the cover. It's yellow and these eyes looking slightly sideways. Everything about it makes you want to pick it up. Yeah. I had mixed feelings about Babel. I felt that here was someone who was such an interesting writer and there was a lot that I really liked about it, but there also was a lot that I didn't think worked. So then I was really keen to read something else by her and I could not have been more delighted by this. I absolutely loved it. And it's funny, there were some things that in the context of Babel I felt were weaknesses that in this because it's a very different book and it does very much focus on this one central character and the psychological journey that she goes on, became really strong yeah. because I thought it worked so well here. Can you describe it? Because it's quite hard to sum up. It is about a woman who is a sort of averagely successful writer. She's got a publishing deal, but she's not as successful as she's like to be. And her friend, sort of frenemy <laughs> from university, is an extremely successful writer has had this astronomical success of someone like Sally Rooney from overnight in their early mid 20s and TV adaptations and films and all the things that you imagine heights of success of a writer would look like. They have a night out one evening and they go back to the successful writer's flat and there's a tragic accident and the successful writer dies the main character, our narrator, swipes the manuscript of her now dead friend's most recent novel and she passes it off as her own, which is awful in itself. But critically, the friend who has died is Chinese American and has written a novel about Chinese history and our narrator is white. And so on rolls this story yes of literary deception but also of appropriation it also interrogates the publishing industry and social media and online culture and okay I don't know about you but I could not put it down yep. but it was like I was gasping and I was like genuinely like visceral reactions There's, there are jump feeling, scares at one point totally and like you feel physically sick and repulsed but also you can't look away yeah there's a bit of social media shaming yes. and tapping into that. There's a lot, I thought, that was really interesting about the way that books are marketed and where the publishing industry chooses to put the money and how that really changes how books are received. If there is a ghost in this book, apart from the ghost of the dead friend, <laughs> Athena, it is, I thought, the author Janine Cummings and her book American Dirt, where there was then a huge scandal. This book had been touted as this great exciting novel it had a huge publicity and marketing campaign and this was the book it was about the woman and her son who flee Mexico and they end up taking the migrant route through to try and get to America to escape this person who is hunting them down and it was felt that actually she did not really have the right to tell this particular story in the way that she had told it and then there was a very interesting conversation I think that was really the thing that kicked it off wasn't it about yeah. who can tell which stories that is ongoing to this Yeah, day. I was going to say, it's not really anything that's been resolved. No, and she's tapping into that in a way that I thought was interesting and thoughtful and perceptive and just fascinating. And I think one thing you wonder is, am I going to be someone who needs to know about the publishing industry to enjoy this? But she gives a lot of explainers along the way. I totally agree. I thought that as well. This is a book that reveals lots of the mythology and also takes the sheen off what is often a romanticised industry. Mm. Such an interesting read. Such a great page turner. Yeah. I really loved it and I was so happy because I wanted to love something that she had written and with mm. this I wholeheartedly did. It's a great book club book as well. Yeah. I think it'd be really good if you want something that's really enjoyable to read that's also not going to take a lot of work. It's a really good summer book club read, I'd say. If you're going on a group holiday or whatever, take a copy and pass it around the poolside, I would say. I'm flipping through because this isn't my copy. My copy's got all these folded corners and all these <laughs> lines that I love. But yeah, and then maybe it's in industry jokes, but there's just a very funny thing about how well her book is doing. The book that June, the main character, has appropriated. 
how well this book is doing overseas except in France but the character says books never do well in France if you're doing well in France there's something weird about you <laughs> <laughs> all right so then what else have you got earmarked for your oh. summer picks it's really interesting when we talk about summer reading I think a lot about what is it about summer reading I think we all have different takes on what summer reading is. I think the industry wants it to be easy breezy, maybe some rom-coms, maybe some thrillers, things that are page turning that you're going to get through quickly. But some people, I think, see holidays as the opportunity to kind of really engage. It's the one time of year they have where they're going to sit and read for a condensed time Mm. in a way that is not possible Mm. when you're managing a busy schedule and normal life is getting in the way. So with that in mind, I think there's various picks that you could make. Something that I recently read on holiday was a book called The Centre by Aisha Manazir Siddiqui, which is kind of along the same lines of Yellow Face in that it's a smart thriller that you cannot put down. It follows a woman who is a translator and she writes the subtitles for Bollywood films. She speaks Urdu fluently when she meets this man who is, to be honest, quite average, but he speaks something like nine languages fluently as if he's lived there. He doesn't come across as supremely intelligent in any other way. And she is fascinated by how he manages to speak so many languages and he sort of brushes it off. But when she tries to teach him Urdu, he can't pick it up. And then she decides to take him to Karachi to visit her family. And when he gets there, he can speak the language fluently. And she's like, hold on, how on earth did you manage to do that? I've been trying to teach it to you for a year. And her family is so impressed. And isn't he the most wonderful? And she's extremely confused and says, look, you have to tell me what your secret is. And he says, well, actually, I go to this place called The Centre. It's a sort of 10-day intense language course. I'm actually not allowed to tell anyone else about it. I'm only ever allowed to tell one person. So you're the only person I can ever tell. And she herself wants to be a literary translator who publishes serious literary fiction. And so she decides she's going to try it herself. And it becomes this really propulsive thriller about language and what is learning a language if you're not immersing yourself in a culture can language be appropriation if you know nothing about the language itself and its origins and all those things and ultimately the question is what is the center and how on earth are they doing it (gasps) that is so intriguing i've had that on my shelf for a while because i got center proof i was always quite intrigued by it but now i'm definitely adding it to the summer tbr yeah i was really intrigued by it and then it got really good reviews as it was coming out for publication i thought oh do you know what i'm going to bring it on holiday Mm, because it's just out now yeah it's much more of a thriller than i thought i don't know what i was expecting but it really is thriller and it's really well written it's really enjoyable it's very dark it's a little bit gruesome so take that on board if you don't want something that gets a bit gruesome then probably one to avoid go for something else instead but if you just want something that you can't put down I read it on an aeroplane that kind of like, you know, can't put down, which is always fun for Mm. a holiday read. Mm. And also I love a bit like Yellow Face, love a thriller that thinks about other things than the mechanics of the plot. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Really enjoyed it. And I passed it on to my colleague Lucy and she also now is romping her way through it. If you want something that is totally immersive, and I know I've spoken on this podcast about it a million times, but Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin is I think the best book I've read in years. It's an old favourite now. Yeah. Feels like it's, cause it's not been out that long. <laughs> it's just it? come out in paperback. <laughs> so we've been talking about some hardbacks. This is a paperback. Yeah. So if you want something that is going to sweep you up, that you can live and walk alongside the characters, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow is for you. And I'm sure lots of you have read it, but if you haven't read it, then honestly, what are you waiting for? It is so good and deserves all the love it has had, I think. It's about two friends who meet in hospital as children. They've both gone through traumatic things and they pass the time and also sort of escape those things, the reason that they're there, by playing video games. You then meet them 10 years later, maybe not quite 10 years later, when they bump into each other at college and they start designing video games together. And they become a smash success, these games. 
And it's about this amazing friendship. But it's also about if you've never played a video game before or you're sceptical of video games, you will realise what an incredible art form they are and how much creativity of all sorts of goes into creating games and how much vision there is. And also real technical execution. By extension, it shows how incredible art itself, whether that's literature or sculpture or music or whatever art form you're thinking about, what an amazing vehicle for community, escapism, joy, pleasure, entertainment, emotional connection, art can be. It's about friendship. It's about creative collaboration, what it's like to see something in your head and then see it out in the world and for people to respond to that. And maybe that resonated with me because of Book Bar. Book Bar once existed in my head and mm. now is a physical thing that people respond to. It's a really extraordinary novel. And for me, it's everything I love about reading in a book and reminds me why I love reading. Oh, I think that's true. I was just chatting with my friend Andy from my book club the other night and he was telling me that he's just read it and he was like, oh, it's so great. I loved it so much. And talking about how it motivated him to start going looking back at the old video games that he used to play when he was growing up. And I think it really, it does tap into something that's a lovely shared thing that most people will have some experience of in some way. And yeah, it's about passion. Mm. It really is. And it's about sharing your passion, whether that's an art form or whether that's anything that you are passionate about. It's about what that passion does for you and the communities it inspires. And that's a really special thing. It's an incredibly special book. And I think it has resonated with readers for that reason. The things that they love about gaming, you love about reading. And also, if you just want a book where you love the characters and you want to walk alongside them, I would recommend passing it on to anyone it really is a book for anyone well, I brought a little stack of books with me seems a bit ridiculous taking books to book bar but <laughs> I did bring a few that I've been setting aside and earmarking for my summer break every year my family and I go away when we're away I delete social media apps from my phone this is my top tip I feel like it's not something people realize you can do but you can just delete it and then when you want to reinstall it again it takes about eight seconds and there you are back up and running and so, yeah, I really put my phone away and then it's amazing how much then that frees up your time for reading. But also I find what's really lovely is that quite quickly and almost slightly reassuringly to me, your brain will adjust and slip into a mode where you're able to do much more sustained thinking. You'll find you're able to concentrate on what you're reading much more effectively. And I love the way that ideas will bubble up. And so I've had this lovely sense of anticipation this year, knowing that this is coming up for me and setting aside some books that I know I'm going to want to be diving into. And one of those that I'm quite excited to read is Small Worlds by Kayla Bazuna Nelson. I enjoyed Open Water, which is his book that was very successful and I think really put him on everyone's radar. I thought the writing was absolutely beautiful. I loved the way he writes. For me, that particular story, I remember, you know, this is just my book club critical mode, for me, there wasn't really enough to it, but I was really interested to read something else by him. And I was so pleased to see that this is longer. It feels like there's much more of a story, maybe more plotty than that last one. So I'm really excited to just find out what that voice that I loved is going to give me next. Yeah, I've read Small Worlds and Open Water and his writing is extraordinary. There's really no one, I can't think of an example of a writer who writes like he does we did an event with him actually the Monday just gone where he was interviewed by the actor Papa Essiedu. It was the most wonderful conversation when you think about book events and why we do them. That was an extraordinary evening. Their conversation was as emotional and intimate as Caleb's writing. And Papa said to me afterwards, I think Caleb's writing is singular. Every micro detail described, but not in a dull way at all, mm. in a really poetic, beautiful way. And I've always talked about Caleb's writing as rather than being cinematic, photographic. And Caleb is a photographer. So you can see that vision, the instinct for detail and moments being translated from photograph to paper. Rather than being sweeping in a cinematic way, he hones in on intimate details about people or emotions talks about dancing a lot in this it's absolutely extraordinary the way that he writes about dancing and music and then he moves on to another image and it never feels disjointed it always flows beautifully but it's not linear he's an extraordinary writer and he spoke a bit about that this is you're right Kate it is fuller I don't know what the word is it's got 
more going on. It's set over three summers rather than, you know, I don't know what open water was, like a, few a few weeks, weeks makes, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And it's about a young man called Stephen who is a burgeoning jazz musician and he's leaving school, falling in love. And then you get him over the next three summers and it takes you from London to Ghana. So there's a longer time frame. But it still retains this beautifully fragmented style of Caleb's writing. It is quite poetic, isn't it? And very beautiful, but at the same time, it's really readable. Mm. So it doesn't feel like overly literary. Or... No, it, exactly. It doesn't feel like experimental in no. the way that some books that you would describe as poetic would. Yeah. It feels extremely readable. And I think the sense of a voice and a perspective that you want to get to know and that pleasure that comes with all books, seeing the world through one person's eyes. Yeah. I think as well, what is interesting about Caleb's writing and what makes his voice unique is that I don't think that I have ever read anything where you feel the heart on the page so much. Hmm. There's a nice quote on the back from Benjamin Zephaniah. He says, let's hear it for Caleb Azuma Nelson, also known as the future. <laughs> Love that. Well, and on that subject of setting aside books that you know you're going to have time to give them a bit of sustained attention, I have... <laughs> For some time now, I had on my bookshelf Time's Shelter by Georgi Gospodinov, who is the Bulgarian author who won this year's Booker International Prize. This has been critically hugely well-received. I only read good things about it, and I keep hearing back from people who've seen him speak. Someone messaged me after hearing him talk at the Hay Festival to say he's absolutely extraordinary. And I was just listening to him on the way here, actually, on the FT Weekends podcast talking about more generally translated fiction and then about his book specifically. And he's just great. He's really interesting to listen to. I'm looking forward to this, but at the same time, I almost have that slight, you know, as with any Booker International Prize, <laughs> shortlisted or winner. I think what's nice about them is that they tend to be books that will ask something of you yeah. and stretch you and challenge you a bit. And I'm looking forward to that. I have read the first chapter. It's about a man who is interested in trying to help people in old age who suffer from memory problems or Alzheimer's and he has this idea that he will set up a space for them where everything is arranged as it was in the past in a period that they remember well and that's perhaps not such a kind of radical idea I feel like there have been a few things recently that have played with that idea but I think what's interesting in this book is that then it's very successful this experiment and what happens then is that whole countries start exploring this idea of returning to the past and it sounds like it raises some really interesting questions about you know we almost have this idea that things were better in the past nostalgia for times gone by and I think one of the things he's exploring is you know is that the case is it helpful to look backwards in that way so yeah super interested to read it and I suspect it will probably then we're planning on doing a, a podcast book club. Maybe this is the exclusive announcement people have been waiting for. But yeah, we've long wanted to do it and we want to do it through Patreon. And so finally, the book club review podcast will also be the book club review book club. That's so exciting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. How's it going to work? My uncertainty for a while was what platform would be best to do it through. I keep coming back to Patreon because I feel like it's just very well set up for facilitating, I suppose, the sort of communication I want to have around it. I really want it to be very interactive. I want people to be able to join and do a live Zoom, but I also want there to be a place where people can leave comments and forums. Mm. I'm very conscious that not everyone is on the same time zone around the world. And, you know, when you have global listenership. Indeed. <laughs> Chrissy. And uh, you really do. Um, You're laughing, you know, but it's what, true. What are the people in New Zealand, you know, going to do if they want to chip in? So, yeah, that's been the process of thinking through what would work the best. So, yeah, I'm excited to do it. That's going to be brilliant. Yeah. I've been having a very nice time actually thinking about what books I want to do as well, which just feels like the fun part. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is the fun part. It really is. On the note of the International Booker Prize, one of my earmarked books that I haven't read yet that I really want to read that I have a customer who comes in regularly and tells me, Chrissy, have you read this yet? Because they know I'll love it, which is always a good endorsement. We're booksellers and we're recommending books all the time to our customers, but it's such a joy when customers come in and recommend books to us mm. because they know what we like and we've got to know, you know, it becomes a reciprocal conversation. This particular customer has been telling me to read this for a while and it was on the shortlist for the International Booker. It's called Whale by Cheon Myung Kwan. Oh yes, this is the Korean novel. South Indeed, Korean. sort of magical realism, I actually know very little about it other than, yes, it does sound quite up my street and quite interesting. 
I think I was expecting maybe it to be harder work than it sounds, which again, I think sometimes is often the mythology around translated fiction, right? I think just because something's been translated doesn't mean it's obscure. It's often a massive commercial success in the country from which it's being translated. Mm. And the reason I think is that it's often small presses that publish works in translation because big publishers don't want to take the risk on them because translation is expensive. You know, expensive. So obviously it potentially reaches a smaller audience or I guess can be a barrier that isn't anything to do with the book or the translation. Do you think that's fair, Kate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think what the host of the FT podcast was saying, which I thought was really interesting and valid, is that it's actually extraordinary to have the opportunity to read an outside perspective so, for example, Time Shelter, she was saying that, you know, it's actually considering things like Brexit and, you know, the way that the EU has evolved, but from the Bulgarian perspective. Yeah. Which obviously is a very different perspective yeah. from the one that we have here in the UK. And what she was saying, and I think it's so true, is that you're not going to get that anywhere else. There is no other way that you are going to experience a Bulgarian's thoughts and insight into larger cultural things that affect all of us. Yeah. Being able to read a book in translation, it's fantastic. It's the most fantastic, miraculous thing. And I think she's right. It really made me think, gosh, yes. You know? Yeah. And I think that's what's really interesting and what is amazing about the International Book Prize. It's just really taken off. And I think it's introduced audiences not only to works in translation, but to smaller presses. Time Shelter is published by one of the big five, I think. So that's not necessarily a good example. But The Whale is published by Europa over here and by a small press in America. I have a very snazzy American edition. I think that's the other thing is that it's also putting small presses on the map. Not just this prize, but the rising popularity of fiction in translation. There's a brilliant article, which Kate, I think you'd absolutely love. I don't know if you saw it in The Guardian this week. Mm. And it was about the rise of small presses. Oh, and how yes. It was an extraordinary article mm. and just made me so excited about publishing and independent publishers and the ecosystem as a whole and reading about the successes of small publishing houses and independent publishing houses that are no longer so small because they've had such success, you know? I did enjoy that article and I'll link to it in the show notes. I smiled to see Jacques Testard, the publisher of Fitzcarraldo, who is such an extraordinary man, but I think also never seen without a grey cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, in the photo, there he was in the great cardigan. I love it. But uh, yeah, we did a whole episode where I had a chat to him about Fitzcarraldo and all the extraordinary authors that they published and the ethos behind his whole endeavour, which is so inspiring. And so, yeah, do check that out if you're interested to know more about Fitzcarraldo. And then also slightly on the Improving Myself section of my stack, I've got this book called How to Read Now by Elaine Castillo. One of my favourites from last year. I didn't know anything about this but I think it might have been like you know one of those I was looking online and sort of popped up and I was just intrigued and I do have this ongoing sub project all the time to try and be a better reader <laughs> and I'm always interested in anything that I think will help me do that you know it's like you go through life and you sort of leave education you leave university and also I'm now not at a time where I have time to do any kind of evening classes or anything like that there was a time when that was something I really used to do but now I'm just like there's no time and you've realised, actually, that it feels like that journey shouldn't end, you know. <laughs> it's good to read things sometimes that I think are going to try and, like, expand your learning a bit, I suppose, and, and maybe stretch and challenge you. And I think this looks really interesting. It says, uh, how many times have we heard that reading builds empathy, mm. that it's important to diversify our bookshelves or that books have saved our lives? These sentiments are noble and can sometimes even be true. But award-winning novelist Elaine Castillo has more ambitious and radical hopes for our reading culture. In this smart, funny, galvanizing collection of linked essays and deeply personal reflections, she attacks the stale ideas about how and what we read and appeals to a more complicated form of engagement, one that acknowledges difficult truths, imagines a more daring solidarity and creates space for a riskier intimacy. Along the way, she remembers the father that inspired her own reading, reimagines the cartography of the classics, takes aim at Nobel Prize winners, <laughs> topples indie darlings and celebrates glorious moments in everything from popular TV to the work of contemporary poets. I've read the first chapter. It's very engaging. It's not an easy read, but I was really up for that. I didn't want it to be something that I would just fly through. And already I have two 
book recommendations. So I love it as a book, not only that's going to maybe shape my own reading, but also is leading me to other books. It's a book that I read last summer when it came out last August in hardback. And I actually, I don't ever do this, but I DM'd the author because I was just like, thank you. Aww. And she's absolutely extraordinary. We had a really wonderful conversation via DM on Instagram. One of the essays that has stayed with me the most, and I remember tweeting about this when I read it, I remember saying, this is a book that everyone in publishing should read and beyond. It should be required reading for anyone who reads or anyone who consumes culture. Because what's interesting about it, it's called How to Read Now, but she doesn't just mean books. She means how do we read the world? How do we read the advertising boards that we see on the tube? How do we digest that information? And so it's as much about the act of reading a book, whether that be fiction or nonfiction, as it is about reading and consuming the world around us. I really, really think anyone that has any interest in going into anything book related or media related, Mm. read this collection of essays. Yeah. And then a couple of things that are not out yet. I was so excited to get a copy of the new Francis Bufford, which is called Cahokia Jazz which comes out in October 2023. I love Francis Bufford. I loved Golden Hill. I loved Light Perpetual. Completely different books, which took some adjustment on my part because when I started reading Light Perpetual, I was like, oh, it's not like Golden Hill. But (laughs) then I fell in love with it anyway. Just his writing. Yeah, he's such a great writer. So I'm just excited. Like I feel like, what's he going to bring me I have no idea. This is also on my pile. Exactly the same. I haven't got to it yet because it's coming out in October, isn't it? So it's one that... I've earmarked for a bit further down the line, but I'm a massive fan of his writing too. In one of the most exciting emails that we ever received at the Book Club Review podcast, he dropped us a line after we talked about Light Perpetual and he said that this Cahokia Jazz apparently is more Golden Hill-ish. Ooh, that's also very cool. That's yeah. a flex, Kate. <laughs> I want an email from Francis Buffett. Francis, if you're listening. I was, it, was the, it was the best, the best email. <laughs> and then another one, as if I didn't have enough books but I couldn't resist I was very excited to see this copy of The Maniac the new book from Benjamin Labatut he is a Dutch author but has lived for a very long time in Santiago in Chile I was completely obsessed with his book When We Cease to Understand the World which was shortlisted for the Booker International I think it was as well yeah maybe that's why I read it yeah new novel from the author of the International Booker shortlisted when we cease to understand the world that was an absolutely fantastic read I just adored it and halfway through it I messaged Phil our friend and regular podcast guest to say you have to read this it's completely extraordinary and then he started reading it texted me and I was like oh my god yes <laughs> so yeah that was an interesting one uh, very unexpected I didn't know anything about him and I thought it was the most incredible book so I'm really keen to see like, what else he's got up his sleeve this is much longer that was my only slight dismay because I think one of the other things I really loved about when we see to understand the world was it's quite short <laughs> yeah there is something about I love a long book that I can get my teeth into and that's something I love when I'm on holiday for summer yeah yeah mm. exactly mm. I love for me I have two versions of summer books, either something I can fly through and just not think too much about, but feels enriching at the same time, but also then something I can get my teeth into and that's a bit longer. Yeah, so that's great. But on a day-to-day basis, obviously really nice to have a slightly shorter book, but not so short that it's harder to get into. Speaking of upcoming that I read recently, it's coming in September. I don't know if you read C. Pam Zhang's How Much of These Hills is gold i have a copy of it on my shelf i shamefully never got around to read so it. was that long listed or short listed for the booker i think a it was long listed. long listed for the booker a few years ago her new novel is called land of milk and honey mm. and was recommended to me a few months ago by caleb azuma nelson oh. the author of small worlds and open water that we spoke about earlier it's so different to how much of these hills is gold it's set in a dystopian time where some experimental farming practices or something like that has created this smog that has engulfed the world and that has led to the extinction of various plants and animals and essentially created a huge Mm. food problem. This already sounds like something I would find quite hard to read. Yeah, the issue at the centre is really horrible but you meet this young chef who has had quite a lot of success, but with the smog has come obviously the end of restaurants as we know it. There's substitutes for flour that don't taste 
anywhere near as good and people's palates have changed and the idea of going and hanging out in a restaurant is a different concept there's a lot of food scarcity basically and a lot of poverty the world over as a result and she ends up getting a job at this very exclusive mountain complex in Italy where essentially the wealthy have retreated Mm. where there's no smog they are developing technologies to bring things back from extinction and they're hopefully finding a way out of the problem with the support of the Italian government as well that's how they've managed to exist is that they have some support from the Italian government who hope that they're going to extend this out and it's going to help everyone but the crucial thing is that that's exactly what would happen the wealthy would use their money to find ways around the problem and of course it wouldn't help everyone and it would be supported by big business and governments who want in and it's really even though it's in this dystopian world like any good dystopia it is very reflective of what would happen and the world that we live in now the writing's amazing this chef becomes immersed in this world and you see her getting drawn into it she is asked to put on these extravagant meals every sunday night for prospective donors and you feel her getting enveloped the writing about food is amazing and you meet these billionaires who are supposedly trying to help other people but are really out for themselves it's a brilliant book and i think it will do really really well Mm. It'll be a great book club book. The writing is really, really good. And it is really addictive to read, but also one of those books that I think I will want to reread because I feel like I probably only scratch the surface of everything that's going on underneath it. Land of Milk and Honey by C. Pam Zhang coming in September. Speaking of billionaires, <laughs> the book that came out in March, Burnham Wood. Oh, yes. By Eleanor Catton. Mm-hmm. And I just think if you want a meaty but totally addictive read for summer... Mm. I think Burnham Wood is the perfect book to take on holiday if you want something thoughtful and unputdownable. Have you read it yet, Kate? I haven't read it yet, but any listeners who listen to every episode will have heard Phil talking about it on our last episode. He just finished it. Oh, did he? He loved it. And I feel like if you read The Luminaries and maybe struggled slightly, if you maybe thought, oh, this writing is so great, but this book is so long and I'm really not sure about the structure... If you had all those thoughts, he said apparently this just like really (laughs) delivers. Totally. For me, it's like every single publisher wants to compare their novel to The Secret History. Everyone wants to recreate The Secret History. Mm. This is not The Secret History. But for me, it had the elements of The Secret History that I loved. It spends the first hundred pages or so a full on character development where you meet this cast of characters, a group of socialist, very left wing climate activists who plant crops on private bits of land as a way of using land that otherwise goes to waste and they are radical and what they're doing is illegal because they're trespassing and using other people's land but they come into contact with this supposedly philanthropic billionaire who is a sort of Elon Musk meets Kendall Roy from Succession. <laughs> sort of, that was my colleague Tom. He's like, it reminds me of Kendall Roy because he's much more charming than Elon Musk is, at least superficially. And they come into contact with him and he offers to financially support them, which obviously goes against everything that they stand for, but would also mean that they can keep going because they are on the brink of collapse. So they're in this really interesting position. Do they stand on their moral high ground and probably fail? Or do they accept this help from someone who stands in opposition to everything they believe in? What starts as this really interesting dilemma and this character study of different characters across the spectrum of politics and also engaging with eco-politics, which, to be honest, I was like, okay, a whole 400-page novel about this. I'm not sure it's like going to sustain me. But my goodness, it then becomes this absolutely propulsive thriller that is unputdownable and becomes almost Shakespearean I read it and was gasping. The first 100 pages, it took me a little bit. I really enjoyed, but they were certainly... And they're very easy to read. It's not like they're difficult, but it's a lot of character development and also scene setting, which is really interesting while you're reading it, but I wasn't returning back to it quickly. And then the last 300 pages I read, I think, in one sitting or pretty much in one sitting. And it was the same. I then passed it on to various 
colleagues. I remember my colleague Lucy, she was sitting down here in our bookseller where we are now having lunch. She finished it over lunch and I heard her come upstairs. I wish you could see my face because her eyes were wide. Her mouth was like, her jaw was on the floor and she just had no words. And it had been the same. Our WhatsApp group went wild in the way that it went wild over tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. But uh-huh. that kind of like, oh my goodness. And the thing is, it's not just one of those books where you're like, wow, what an amazing plot. And it just gets more and more and you just can't look away. But also extraordinary writing. And also the reason why I compare it to The Secret History is that it is all about these people and their motivations and the, the hidden motivations, the things they hide from one another and the things they're not admitting to themselves. But then you also get this slightly geeky insight into, you know, in the secret history, it's like about classics and particularly Greek tragedy and that academic thing. In this, it's environmental politics. And neither of those things are necessarily things that a vast majority of the population are going to think, yes, I want to read a novel about that. Obviously, the environmental crisis is hugely important, but it's probably not something that you think is going to be the subject of an unput downable thriller right <laughs> you know <laughs> and probably same with greek tragedy and yet both of the books deliver on being an unput downable thriller with a lot of nuance and intelligence and superb writing which is why i compare it to secret history they're so different but i think if those are the things you liked about the secret history and when people compare a book to the secret history that's what you're always looking for but are slightly disappointed then you'll love this yeah the secret history we should say by donna tart mm. which is a real cult classic if you haven't read that actually (laughs) yeah great book to take on holiday as well put that one on your holiday stack because it really is a fantastic read i have this feeling that burnham wood is going to appear on the booker shortlist and if it does i will then be reading it as part of the reading we do every year for our booker prize show i really hope it ends up on the shortlist that and the book we haven't spoken about the barbara king solver demon Cophead, are the two that i really really want to see and i know they're both by established writers and the luminaries elena catton's last book won the Booker Prize so who knows and yes Demon Cobhead we've talked about quite a lot on the pod but that obviously is the book that won the Women's Prize by Barbara Kingsolver which is just a thumping good read it is such a fantastic page turner yeah it's really looking at some very interesting things in society as well it's to do with the opioid crisis which has struck particularly hard in America and this particular region of America where Kingsolver is from she said it was a story that she had wanted to tell all her life really and she had struggled for years to figure out a way to tell it and then apparently I watched a talk she gave at the Hay Festival and she was saying that she went to Dickens's house Charles Dickens's house which is in Broadstairs here in the UK and she was staying overnight at this place and she was able to go to his room the room that is still there preserved it was his study it's where he wrote his books and she said she was visited by his ghost who told her Barbara Don't you see, I've done it all before. I've already told this story. And she had this moment of revelation. She realized that with the structure of David Copperfield, that's what she needed to be able to tell this story in the way that she wanted to tell it and to bring that story into very much sort of contemporary world. So yeah, again, if you're looking for a good chunky novel to put on your summer reading stack... Don't miss that one. I hadn't heard that anecdote, and that is amazing. I've got got chills. It's also very Dickensian, you know? It's a very Dickensian story. I mean, Barbara King's she knows how to tell a good story, and I feel like that is the story you want to hear about (laughs) where it came from. Yeah, amazing. It is an extraordinary book. Yeah, another one for your piles. Your increasingly large piles, I think. Yes, I better call it quits while I'm ahead. It's been so great to talk about books with you, both summer reading and books to watch out for. As ever, it's always a huge pleasure. It's so much fun. I love doing it. I love coming on and I love the Book Club Review Pod. It's it's a real fave. Well, you're so kind. You've always been incredibly supportive. And I think now we're going to get a chance to speak to Lucy, who's been manning the shop all this time. But I think she's got a pick or two to tell us about as well. Well, Lucy, it's very nice to talk to you in person. We've already had, I think, a sneak preview of a few of your summer reading experiences already, which has been really fun. We heard that you really liked Burnham Wood by Eleanor Catton. I loved Burnham Wood. The whole team, the whole team, we're obsessed with that book. It's one of those ones you start telling people the plot and they sort of glaze over a little bit, like with Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And we had to say, no, no, it's the most amazing story. It sounds bizarre, but it just works and it's brilliant and the characters in it and that ending. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I won't say any. If you, okay, if you finished it. No, I Oh, my seen. goodness. Okay. When you finished it, you have to come back okay. and talk to us. Deal. What else then have you got on your summer reading radar? Yes. 
So I gather Chrissy has talked about quite a few of our faves already. I've done a lot of the obvious ones. <laughs> We've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> OK, so looking at what Chrissy hasn't talked about, I read on holiday when I went away a few weeks ago, Tom Lake by Anne Patchett, which is her new novel. And it's just wonderful. She's the most warm, generous writer, but also a brilliant storyteller. It's about a woman who is talking to her three daughters and she's telling them a story in current day during the pandemic and she's telling them a story about the first man that she loved who is really famous is an actor and so it's this wonderful story that's cut with her talking to her children and then her as a young 16 17 year old going into the world of acting and how her life changed if you want something that has a great story but will make you feel warm and happy i would recommend tom lake by ann patchett we were talking about Anne Patcher earlier, and I actually just read something recently that I snapped up in that way that I'm always very interested in books about books or books that I think are going to lead me to other books. And this is a funny little American book. It's called Read This, Ooh. and it is a book of lists, each submitted by a different independent bookshop. And the chap who had the idea to put it together, he's a bookseller, and he wrote his own 50 the books that he loves to recommend, the books that he hand sells, the books that maybe are the books that you, know, you wouldn't necessarily know about, but booksellers know about. Mm. So he did his list. And mm. then he thought, oh, I should ask other bookshops what their lists are. And so this book, Read This, is a compilation of all of these lists. Mm. And I love the simplicity of it. There's really nothing to it. It's just these lists of books. Mm. And then each contributor does get the opportunity then to expand on two or three. So mm. you get a little bit more information. But very much other than that, it's just titles and you mm. go off and see if you're interested in them or not but the introduction is by Anne Patchett oh. and she's writing a little bit about her experiences as a bookseller yes. Chris and I were talking about the fact that she owns a bookshop and at the end of that introduction she talks about Kindles and e-reading mm. and the ability to download a book at the touch of a button from mm. Amazon and she said what you won't get from any of that experience is conversation mm. you know that is what you'll get if yeah. you go to an independent bookshop yeah. and you will have a conversation and you will discover new books she's so great Anne Patchett she's such a love just the, well I haven't met her personally but <laughs> obviously I've seen Chrissy's interview and I've read a couple of her books and I just think she's lovely if you haven't read the essays they're not really like essays they're more like pieces I suppose about her life mm. these precious days mm. which came out in paperback at the end of last year I totally completely loved them you know you always have that friend the friend that you want to give the books that you love the most to for me that's someone called Prim and I gave her that and she loved it so much as well it's just wonderful and really stays with you so yes and Patrick what an amazing author yeah I have that book and I totally endorse that they're oh. wonderful they're really really wonderful they're so rich mm. so yeah that's also a strong recommend <laughs> yeah good non-fiction pick for yeah. summer what else have you got in your little post-it note there right my little post-it note of the ones Chrissy has not discussed <laughs> there are two more I can't tell you a lot about them because they're the two that I'm really excited to read that are coming out. The first one is Roman Stories by Jhumpa Lahiri, who is the most incredible author, prize-winning American author, and famously became very, very obsessed with writing and speaking only in Italian. And she's written these amazing books in Italian, and they've been translated into English. And this is her new one coming out. It's short stories, and I can't wait I think she's the most talented wonderful storyteller but there's a depth to it as well she's analyzing the place that language has with us and as an author how the language you use impacts on your identity in a way and obviously choosing to write in a completely new language to her they're just fantastic the first one I think that came out in England is called in other words, which is sort of her diary entries of beginning to write in Italian, again written in Italian and translated. And for anyone that speaks Italian, they're great because each page you've got on the left, the words in Italian, and on the right, the words in English. And then Whereabouts, which came out a couple of years ago. So I'm very excited about her short stories. I love Whereabouts as well. That really took me by surprise how much I enjoyed that. And I think that's a really great summer pick if you haven't read it yet. It's about a woman who is wandering round... I think it's an unnamed Italian city, mm. but you think perhaps it's Rome because I think yes. that's where she lives, yes. isn't it? And not much happens. She mm. just sort of drifts about and thinks her thoughts and, mm. and experiences these little everyday things. But it is so rich and immersive. And I felt so connected to the narrator and I was so invested in her point of view and I absolutely loved it. And there is something about, I think, 
you're absolutely right the way that she writes there is a sense of every word being weighed mm. that actually is incredibly pleasing mm. you don't get bogged down in mm. it it doesn't make it hard to read but there mm. is just the sense of precision that I mm. absolutely adored mm. and I remember finding excuses so that I could steal away and just yeah. read this book alone in the quiet by myself yes. because it felt like it needed yes. that degree of attention yes. I loved it so that's whereabouts by Jhumpa Lahiri and also I think interesting you said you wanted to read it and steal away on your own because a lot of it is about solitude mm. isn't it chosen mm. solitude which I find so interesting from the perspective of a woman and a woman and I can't remember I read it last year the woman I think is in her 40s or 50s and she's chosen to be alone mm-hmm. I find that so compelling and so interesting to read it's wonderful and quite short as well mm. so if you want to take a few reads with you that's a great one because it's quite slim <laughs> so that's one i'm excited about and then the last but by no means least for anyone here at book bar is dolly alderton's new novel which chrissy and i and the whole team are very excited about reading it's called good material and it's coming out later this year very excited about love dolly alderton she's brilliant that's everything on my post-it well i think anyone would agree listeners you've got more than enough <laughs> recommendations <laughs> and I reckon you could choose what one two three of any of those suggestions and you would have yourself a fantastic holiday reading stack that's nearly it for this episode books mentioned were The Guest by Emma Klein Yellow Face by Rebecca Kwang The Centre by Aisha Manazir Siddiqui Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin Small Worlds by Caleb Azuma Nelson Time Shelter by Georgi Gospodinov, Whale by Chong Myung Gwan, How to Read Now by Elaine Castillo, and her novel America is Not the Heart, Cahokia Jazz by Francis Spufford, The Maniac by Benjamin Labatou, Burnham Wood by Eleanor Catton, The Secret History by Donna Tart, Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, Tom Lake and These Precious Days by Anne Patchett, Read This, hand-picked favourites from America's indie bookstores, compiled by Hans Wim, Roman Stories and Whereabouts by Jhumpa Lahiri, and Dolly Alderson's new book, Good Material. For more from Book Bar and recommendations for summer and beyond, head over to bookbaruk.com. This episode of the Book Club Review was edited and produced by me, Kate Slotover, here in London. You can comment anytime on the episode page on our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk, which is also the place to go for an episode transcript. And if you like this show, have a browse through our archive where you'll find over a hundred more. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, do follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on X at Book Club Review Pod, or get in touch direct at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. You'll also find my reading log over on threads at Book Club Review Podcast. Next up, it's back to school and a good moment to consider the big ideas in life. I'll be joined by Johnny Thompson, an author who excels at distilling complicated philosophical concepts down to 2,200 characters on Instagram. He's going to help us get more of a sense of how philosophy can help us as we live and read. Plus, you might be surprised to learn just how much of your DNA you share with a banana. Until then... Thanks for listening and happy book clubbing.